September 27, 2014, at noon local time in Japan, Mount Antake suddenly exploded without warning. Many hikers and tourists were on the mountain at the time. One person tweeted a picture of the top of the volcano moments before it erupted. Over 30 people are now feared dead. Japan is a very active area for earthquakes and volcanoes. It's closely monitored, continuously monitored, yet it underscores that scientists still don't understand volcanoes well enough to predict them accurately. Mount Antake shows that we won't always get months of warning like we did with Mount St. Helens before a volcano explodes. And if recent research papers are correct, supervolcanoes like Yellowstone could explode suddenly, without warning, without seismic movement signaled as earthquakes. When we think of an explosive volcanic eruption, we imagine it being preceded by earthquakes, by ground swelling, by the mountain venting some hot gas, perhaps even some lava. These are the signs we look for in the inexact science of volcanic predictions. But two research papers published on the very same day this year say that predicting supervolcano eruptions is even more difficult than predicting the eruptions of regular volcanoes. More on that in a moment. But first, do the events in Yellowstone earlier this year demonstrate changes that may be building toward an eruption? We did have an earthquake of 4.8 magnitude. Now that is the largest we've had in Yellowstone in over 30 years. And a couple of months later, shuts down a road that's melted because of increased ground temperature. People start to get edgy about an impending eruption. I went to Yellowstone recently, and geothermal activity is everywhere. A reminder that you're on top of a super caldera and magma dome, the largest on Earth. Frankly, we are just a a few miles above some really hot magma. That magma serves as the heat that fuels the geysers and hot springs and fumaroles in the park. It's that engine that allows for the unique things that we see here in Yellowstone. This is what the melted road looks like two months later. Yellowstone spokesman at the time said the road had turned to soup and that was widely reported even in the mainstream media. But when I spoke to a ranger there, she dismissed it as simply a bad asphalt job that was closed due to uh, melting the heat? Uh, no, melt. no, it has nothing to do with that. That was just a couple of days. It was the asphalt was soft. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, a bad asphalt job that they had done the summer previous to that. Okay. And that combined with the intensity of the sun in the middle of the summer um, and that it was in a hydrothermal area that it just got soft. Oh, okay. And they right. just had to replace it. So it had nothing to do with an increase in geothermal activity in that area, no. the ground being hotter, it was just no. the asphalt, was it? The, the asphalt, yeah, it was the combination of those things in that particular spot. I hadn't visited Firehole Lake Drive when I spoke to her, or I would have challenged what she told me. Two months later, the road still doesn't look good. But more importantly, Yellowstone spokesman told the press at the time that people needed to stay away from the road because there was a high danger of stepping on seemingly solid soil into severely hot water. Contrary to what she said, Firehole Lake is an active geothermal area, and you can see that the road deteriorates as it comes into proximity to geothermal features. But it's what we've come to expect from government employees at every level, fear for their job if controversy erupts, and contempt for the public's right to know. If it was just a bad asphalt job heated up by the sun rather than increased ground temperature, then why are there other melted paved areas that they've just fenced off rather than try to fix? My suspicion is that the spots are so hot at the moment that they can't fix them. Ground temperature goes up and down with seismic activity in the park. We see between 1,000 and 3,000 earthquakes a year in Yellowstone. Most of them are so small, nobody ever feels them. Swarms of small earthquakes that you can't even feel can cause the ground to go through major changes. Look at this area that was once a forest. The ground was a hospitable environment for trees to grow for a long period of time. Then in 1978, swarms of small earthquakes caused the ground in this area to rise to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't the quakes, but the heat that killed the trees. So while we may be heading into another period of increased activity in Yellowstone, it's far from the largest activity we've seen since it became a park. Of course, everyone will tell you that it's not if, but when the super caldera blows up. The difficulty, of course, is knowing when that's going to happen. Two research papers that were released on the same day this year, January the 5th, 2014, say that supervolcanoes aren't just bigger volcanoes. They have a completely different mechanism. The firing mechanism is a function of the buoyancy of the gigantic magma dome and the size of the dome. It makes it much more unpredictable than a regular volcano, 
And about the same time, these research papers were saying that the eruption of a supervolcano was a function of magma dome size, we learned that Yellowstone's magma dome is two and a half times larger than they previously thought. 55 miles long, 18 miles wide, 3 to 9 miles deep. For the sake of comparison, let's pretend for a moment that global warming predictions used to justify global taxation of man-made global warming are true. The IPCC's worst case scenarios range from a 1 to 3 degree centigrade increase to a 2 to 6 degree centigrade increase, and that's over a 100 year period. But if the Yellowstone supervolcano erupted, scientists say it could drop temperatures 10 degrees centigrade, that's about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, globally and 12 degrees, or 22 degrees Fahrenheit, in the northern hemisphere for 6 to 10 years. In other words, that's 2 to 10 times the change in temperature of the most alarmist scenario that Al Gore can imagine. And it would happen immediately, not stretched out over 100 years, and it would last for a decade. That would be real climate change. And of course, that would just be the temperature effect of a supervolcano eruption. There's also the devastation of the ash covering the ground and the massive explosion estimated to be 1,000 times the size of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb every second. The science of, uh, of volcanic predictions is very new mm -hmm. um, and unreliable at best. I think most of the ones that they think they'd be able to predict, they're thinking like maybe hours to days mm. that they'd be able to give people. This one, we, we think we know what, it, what we'd be looking for, and most of those are for little Mount St. Helens style eruptions, mm -hmm. which, is, which is little compared to this. Yeah. Yes, the deadliest, most destructive volcanic eruption in U.S. history, where 57 people died, is a very tiny eruption compared to what could happen even with a partial eruption at Yellowstone. Mount St. Helens began in March 15, 1980, with a lot of earthquakes, over 100 in six days. Then a 4.2 magnitude earthquake, a little smaller than the 4.8 Yellowstone quake in April. Five days later, seven earthquakes, all over magnitude 4.0 in just one day. The next day, the first eruption with a plume of 7,000 feet. The volcano continued to erupt over several weeks, and the plume rose to 20,000 feet. By April 17th, about a month after the volcano became active, a bulge began growing on the side of the mountain and began to grow at 5 to 8 feet per day. U.S. Geological Service volcanologist David A. Johnston, shown here exploring the bulge the day before it exploded, believed the volcano was about to explode catastrophically, unlike some of his colleagues. Nevertheless, he and other scientists were surprised by the extent of the explosion. When the mountain exploded the next day, the pyroclastic flow of rock and hot gas at nearly 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit would have begun at 220 miles per hour and accelerated downhill to 670 miles per hour, reaching Johnston's camp six miles away in less than a minute. He only had time to radio, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. An amateur radio operator, Gary Martin, located a little farther away than David Johnston, saw the pyroclastic flow overtake Johnston's camp. He radioed, Gentlemen, the uh, camper and the car sitting over to the south of me is covered. Then his radio went silent. It completely destroyed an area of 230 square miles in the matter of um, somewhere between five and, and nine minutes. It essentially killed every living thing um, within an area of 230 square miles. Bear in mind, Mount St. Helens was one one thousandth the size of the Yellowstone caldera. And after months of warning, 57 people still died. Mount Pinatubo, about a decade later, after months of warning, still nearly 900 people died there. And that was still 1% of the size of Yellowstone. So even if the entire caldera does not erupt at once, a small partial eruption of Yellowstone could still be the largest natural disaster the United States has ever seen. There's much we don't know yet about volcanoes. And we know even less about the mechanisms of supervolcanoes. Yellowstone is a beautiful and fascinating place. It's truly unique. It's a reminder that we still know very little about the massive forces that continue to shape our planet. And it reminds us how presumptuous our climate predictions truly are. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm David Knight.